I read something recently that kind of blew my mind. About 45% of homes in this country face at least one kind of severe or extreme climate risk from flood, wind, wildfire, heat, or air quality. Almost half that figure comes from Realtor.com. I mean, just look at what's happened in the past year. Whether it's severe storms in the South and Midwest, wildfires in Texas, extreme heat in Arizona, or catastrophic flooding in Vermont, no place is immune from the effects of the climate crisis. And a lot of us have found ourselves asking some form of this question sent to us from a How We Survive listener. Hi, my name is Anna, and I live in Dallas, Texas. My question is, where should I live? Every now and then I look at maps and try to determine the safest place, but I don't even know where to start when it comes to evaluating climate risk. To help answer Anna's question, I'm talking with Samantha Fields, a senior reporter at Marketplace, who's been interviewing experts and homeowners and renters about the risks we're facing. And through her reporting, she's picked up some really helpful tips about how to evaluate risk and figure out where it's safe to live. So how should someone like Anna evaluate where it's safe to live? Well, first of all, I just want to say, I think about this all the time also as someone who doesn't own a home yet, but who would like to maybe in the not so distant future. This is something my partner and I talk about. It's one of the top things on our list of how do we decide where we want to buy a house. And it's hard, right? I mean, it feels like the risks are rising everywhere because they are in most places. And, you know, we were, say, we, we live in New York City, and we were thinking maybe we'll buy something upstate New York, not that far. And then in the last couple of years, in the last year in particular, there have been a few huge flooding events that have, you know, decimated communities upstate that I never would have thought of as being in a flood zone, for example, because they're inland. Um, and so it just makes you realize these risks are everywhere. They're hard to evaluate, especially if you don't know a community. But the reality is actually, I'm learning, there are a fair number of tools that are out there now that you can look at to kind of get a sense of at least some risk, right? So one of the most interesting ones in my mind comes from the First Street Foundation, which is a nonprofit that's done a ton of work sort of modeling climate risk using data that is accessible to regular people that isn't as accessible to regular people and kind of pulling it all together. And they basically have these tools that you can now find on Redfin and on Realtor.com, where if you scroll down on a listing for a house, you'll see climate risks on the page and they have flood, fire, heat, wind, um, air quality. And you can sort of click through and you can see a number from one to 10 for the property. And it's kind of evaluating both the current risk and future risk as modeled by their models. And it's pretty interesting. You know, you can find a home and see that the flood risk is, say, one, and the fire risk is one, but the heat risk is a uh, seven. And so it just kind of gives you a sense of what the risks might be for that particular property. And they do it at the property level, which I think is pretty cool. Okay. So I'm going to go to, um, I guess, redfin.com. Yeah. Redfin's a good one. Okay. For seeing this <clears throat> risk. All right. I'm going to look up my address. I'm going to withhold that address for privacy reasons. <laughs> you don't want but, everyone uh, to know? <laughs> okay. So I found my house. I live in North Baltimore. All right. You're going to want to scroll down to the bottom, and I think it'll say something like climate risk. Okay. Or maybe just climate. All right. So I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Property details, exterior, It's way down at the bottom, which I also find interesting. Tree. Yeah, it's way at the bottom. So you have to look for this. If you, you do wanna. have to. You have to want to find it. Okay, so climate risks, flood factor, minimal, unlikely to flood in the next 30 years. Well, that's good news. Fire factor, minimal, heat factor, major. Seven days above 104 degrees expected this year, 14 days in 30 years. Wow. Yeah, that doesn't sound pleasant. Wind factor major, 20% chance of strong winds in the next next 30 years. Air factor moderate, three unhealthy days expected this year, six days in 30 years. So all of those things are, are going up. 
Um, the heat, yeah, that's that's worrisome. And the wind, I mean, um, I know that First Street Foundation uh, was involved in some research showing that hurricanes are, the, the strength of hurricanes is going to be higher in the future. And also they may hit further north and further yep. inland than in the past. And I've, I've certainly uh, slept on the ground floor during, during a couple hurricanes here in Baltimore um, that did reach us. So I'm sure that's part of that wind factor. One of the things I wanted to ask you, though, is about insurance, because I yeah. think even if you can tolerate the risk of a certain place and, and you're not that worried about it, your insurance company might not be so interested in tolerating that risk. And we've seen more insurers pulling out of areas yeah. with a lot of wildfire risk and hurricane risk. Um, how is insurance affecting people's decisions about where to live and where they can afford to live? You know, it's interesting. I'm not sure it's affecting people's decisions a lot yet, but I think it should be, to be honest. And that's another thing I think about too, because as you said, insurers are increasingly pulling out of places that they perceive as being too high risk and dropping existing customers. Even if there hasn't been, say, a wildfire or you know a flood or a storm in that area recently, if there have been ones nearby or they just perceive it as a rising risk, they're dropping people. And I've talked to people, I know you've talked to people in Florida who this has happened to. I've talked to people in California who this has happened to. A family in Oakland who had been there for years, never had a fire in the time that they'd lived in their neighborhood of Oakland. And a few years ago, their insurer dropped them and they started shopping around for new home insurance and everything they were finding at first was four times more expensive. And that really freaked them out. The woman that I spoke to, the homeowner, she said, you know, I always assumed this would be our forever home. And, and now I'm not sure because of the insurance increase. And um, another person I talked to was dropped uh, by her insurer. And the only plan she was able was able to get was the state insurer of last resort, the California Fair Plan, which is more expensive and gives you less coverage. So this is happening a lot. And um, I think it's something that people really want to think about when they're looking at homes. And something that you can do, actually, it seems in a lot of places, is you can get an independent insurance agent. If you're actively home searching, right, you can get an independent insurance agent and you can ask them for some quotes on a property even before you buy it, even before you put in an offer. And that might give you a sense of, hey, insurance is going to be really hard to get or insurance is going to be a lot more expensive than I thought. And if that's the case before you even buy a property, that's a pretty big red flag and something that you want to consider. I'm also hearing that if you're looking to buy a home, especially right now with mortgage rates so high, relatively speaking, if you can barely afford your payment you should be thinking about insurance going up in the future because as we know, climate risks are only getting worse and there are a lot of other factors that are making insurance more expensive. Even in areas that we think of as less risky, people are seeing their policy, their premiums go up. Right. Especially I think, you know, if you're feeling stretched a little bit, right? Which, you know, with home prices so high and mortgage rates so high, I think a lot of people are feeling stretched trying to just afford a down payment and the monthly payment now. Like you were saying, there's a good chance it could go up. Yeah. What about renters, though, Sam? Uh, should they be as worried about um, these risks to property if, if they're not the ones who own it? And what should they be thinking about? I think maybe not as worried just because you don't have to factor in, is a property going to appreciate? Am I going to have to replace the property if something happens to it? Um, I think the risks are a little bit lower. But it does matter still, right? Because if you're a renter and you move into an apartment and then it floods or there's a fire and one, if, you know, worst case scenario, you're displaced and a lot of people around you are displaced, suddenly it's it may be harder to find a new apartment, right? It may be harder to find one at all. Or if you're able to, it may be a lot more expensive because the rental stock has been decimated. So that's definitely something to think about. Um, you know, another issue, I talked to a woman here in Brooklyn where I live who moved into an apartment a few years ago. It's rent stabilized, which means it's below market rate. 
the you know amount of rent that she pays each month can only go up a little bit. And it was a great find. She found it in 2020 when everyone had moved out of New York. And so she, you know, felt like she had scored. And then it started flooding because it's a duplex and half of it is sort of at street level and half of it is uh, at basement level. And it started flooding in bad rainstorms. And it had never occurred to her, her partner, that that might be a issue. And their landlord has not been very responsive. And it's happened a number of times. And it's, you know, half of their living space is, is you know, being flooded on a semi-regular basis, but they can't afford to move. Because yeah. now, four years later, rents have gone up hugely. Rent stabilized apartments are really hard to find, and market rate is out of their reach. And so they're kind of stuck in this apartment that floods regularly. And, you know, she said if she had known, they never would have moved in. And so I think it is important to think about these risks, even if you are not the owner, because it could affect your quality of life, it could affect your belongings. Um, and, you know, renters can use a lot of the same tools that people who own homes or are buying homes can use. You can look at the property on sort of Redfin and Realtor.com at these risks. Uh, you can also just kind of, you know, another thing I think that's really important for everyone, renters or potential homeowners, is to just kind of ask around in the neighborhood. If you're thinking of moving somewhere, you can talk to neighbors, you can talk to business owners, you can Google the area that you're thinking of moving to see if there's been many sort of news stories about uh, either flooding or fires or whatever risk is most likely in your area. Because all of the, oftentimes this stuff will pop up, right? You'll, you'll be able to learn from somebody or, you know, from a news story about potential risks in a place. And I think it's worth it for homeowners and renters to do that. Yeah, although, I mean, when we bought our house, we asked the owner about the basement. Had it ever flooded? He said, no, never had any water down there. <laughs> right. You're I mean, not always going to find out everything for right. sure. And then we proceeded to buy a wet vac because it flooded all the yeah. time. So going back to Anna's question, Anna from Dallas, are there places that are safer than others, um, generally speaking, that, that we can help her uh, consider as she thinks about where to live? Help all of us consider. Right. Um, when I've asked people this question, the only sort of safe region of this country that comes up is the Great Lakes region. And, and to some degree, the Northeast, although someone from First Street was saying to me, with the way that uh, intense precipitation events and flooding from those are increasing in the Northeast more than anywhere else, that is definitely kind of a big deal um, to consider. But the Great Lakes seem to be the best part of the United States if you want to sort of move specifically for climate risk, climate resilience. That said, as we were talking about before, you know, for most people, climate is one factor, maybe a really important factor when they're thinking about where to live. But maybe, Anna, maybe your family's all in Texas or all of your friends or you have a career that is very tied to the area and you don't want to move your whole life to the Great Lakes. Maybe you don't know anyone there. I mean, that's the case for me, right? Right. And so I think that, I think it's important to consider, I'm considering it a lot, but at the same time, you know, you have to take these other factors into account. And something that, again, somebody at First Street was telling me about is or, or was saying is that risk is relative, right? And say you want to, you know, look up the risk factor for flooding. Uh, if you're in Miami, you're not going to find, you know, a house that's you're probably not going to find a house that's like a one or a two minimal, you know, flood risk in Miami. Whereas in the Northeast, that's probably what you're going to look for. In Miami, he was saying, you know, you might want to look for a property that's a five or a six instead of a nine or a 10 if you're, if you're looking at flood risk. In California, in parts of California, you know, you're probably not going to get a fire risk that's, you know, a one or a two, but maybe you can find a four or a five instead of a nine or a 10. And so it's sort of weighing those risks relative to where you want to live um, and trying to sort of get them as low as you can. And that that struck me as a very reasonable way to approach this when thinking about where you want to live. And, you know, another thing that's just important to sort of realize and that I've been trying to tell myself is there's always going to be unknowns. You can do your due diligence and you should. You're going to want to do that. But at a certain point, once you've sort of checked all the tools, you've asked around, you've done as much as you can, you have to accept that there is a certain amount of unknown risk for the future when it comes to climate change and other things. And I think 
the best you can do then is try to protect yourself with insurance, with flood insurance, and with hardening your home. Do whatever you can to sort of, once you've made a decision, bought a home or moved in as a tenant maybe, just sort of try to protect yourself because you never know. 